This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Pluto. Do you wish people were ridiculously obsessed with balls of ice three billion miles away? Try Pluto today. Welcome to episode 59 of the Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, September 24th. You can subscribe to the Sweaty Penguin on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review, and you will get a shout-out at the end of the show. The other way to get a shout out, join our Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll also get access to some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and more. You can do that by heading over to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Today, we are talking about neighborhoods, a place where somehow I have never once in real life come across a lemonade stand. I feel like between all the talk of lemonade stands in the media, in economics textbooks, in basically every entrepreneur origin story, I would have at one time in my life been on a walk or run and come across a lemonade stand. But no, it's never happened. Either the media is setting my expectations for cheap street side homemade lemonade way too high, or I'm just ridiculously unlucky. But we're not just talking about neighborhoods and their lack of lemonade today. We'll be talking about the links between the environment and gentrification. Gentrification, according to the Urban Displacement Project, is a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in a historically disinvested neighborhood by means of real estate investment and new higher income residents moving in, as well as demographic change, not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of the changes in the education level or racial makeup of residents. Very often, that takes the form of white households moving into a neighborhood that's historically been home to predominantly people of color. I want to start by saying gentrification is a really complicated and at times uncomfortable issue. It's uncomfortable because of the historical issues that lead up to it, and it's uncomfortable because in so many ways, gentrification is kind of a double-edged sword. In fact, thinking through gentrification might be the one thing more uncomfortable than sitting on an actual double-edged sword. Just listen to these residents of Harlem, a New York City neighborhood that has had a large percentage of black residents for the last century, grapple with the fact that Whole Foods opened a location there in 2017. There's literally nothing but liquor stores and fast food restaurants, so to actually have something that's wholesome and is healthy, I feel like was definitely needed for this, um, for this area. It's needed, but it was also needed 20 years ago. They waited until Harlem got significantly white before they chose to put food that we could eat here. As much as we'd love if oat milk and yerba mate could solve issues beyond just gastrointestinal ones, these residents still seem to be concerned about Whole Foods entering their community and understandably ticked off at the timing of it, even though Whole Foods would bring wholesome and healthy foods they'd also want access to. So let's break this case down a little more. It is true that Central Harlem's obesity rate of 28% in 2015 was nearly twice the obesity rate for Manhattan at 16%. It is true that Harlem has been called a food desert because of the lack of available fresh produce. It is true that Whole Foods sells fresh produce. It is true that according to a Bank of America study, Whole Foods produce sells at a 25% premium compared to that same produce at Walmart. It is true that rent prices and property values go up above and near a Whole Foods, a phenomenon actually nicknamed the Whole Foods effect. It is true that when rent goes up, a low-income household may either face more financial hardship or have to move out, that same household being the one that didn't have access to fresh produce and face these increased obesity rates in the first place. All of this is true, 
and yet it's impossible for us to make sense of, and clearly really hard for members of the community to grapple with. And that's not even including aspects like the already changing demographics of Harlem and the history of policies that lay the foundation beneath this whole issue. Instead of if you give a mouse a cookie, it's if you give a mouse a vegetable but charge $700 more per month for its hole behind the fridge. This is why, when you hear reactions from Harlem residents in that clip, they seem to be all over the map. To see all this contemplation just over the opening of a grocery store shows us how complicated and uncomfortable of an issue gentrification is. And if that broke your brain, get ready, because gentrification is a much bigger issue than a Whole Foods in Harlem. In fact, it's way too much to even scratch the surface of in this podcast. As such, I'll be focusing on two contributors to gentrification, climate change and urban green space. We're going to consider how these issues intersect with the much larger issue of gentrification and discuss the very difficult question of where we go from here. But first, a very truncated history lesson. Not a big one, more like one you'd see on Drunk History, but a lot less entertaining because I'm not drunk, I'm not a C-list comedian, and I don't have Jack McBriar on retainer to help me tell the story. So in 1934, the U.S. established the Federal Housing Administration, and one of the FHA's early acts was to color code maps of every U.S. metropolitan area to indicate where it was safe to insure mortgages. I guess it makes sense, right? If young kids get coloring books, why shouldn't young federal agencies get something to color in too? Well, any area where black Americans lived or lived nearby was colored red to indicate it was too risky to insure mortgages, a practice we now know as redlining. In fact, the underwriting manual of the FHA actually said, quote, incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. Yeah, I know. Redlining, along with other issues such as the GI Bill denying home loans to Black World War II veterans, fear of school integration after Brown v. Board, and even direct requirements from the FHA to builders that in order to receive subsidies for new suburban developments, they were not allowed to sell homes to Black people, led to a phenomenon called white flight. White people moved out of cities and bought homes in the suburbs, and black people who were barred by these policies from joining in on home ownership remained in the cities. Then, cities started clearing out homes, businesses, and neighborhood institutions to build highways, expensive high-rises, and government and commercial buildings in a process now called urban renewal, leaving behind these black communities and other communities of color that had already bore the brunt of that string of horrifically unjust policies. I don't know how we can call this urban renewal when these neighborhoods didn't get renewed, they got re-screwed. Now, you might be thinking, Ethan, that's a long time ago. These policies don't exist anymore. And that's true. The Civil War ended in 1865, and we don't eat pickled eggs anymore, right? Oh, wait, we do? People still do that? Well, that's disappointing. But back to redlining. In 1968, the U.S. passed the Fair Housing Act, which makes it unlawful to discriminate in the terms, conditions, or privileges of sale of a dwelling because of race or national origin, a sharp turn from the Federal Housing Administration's old manual. Unfortunately, even 53 years later, the problem still persists. Just listen to journalist Emmanuel Martinez share some of the results from an analysis he did of 31 million mortgage records between 2015 and 2016 across 61 metros in the U.S. My analysis includes nine different factors. Among them are the applicant's income, the size of the loan, and specific information about the neighborhood that they're looking to buy in. Here we have the likelihood of denial, so black applicants in Philadelphia are almost three times as likely to be denied a conventional mortgage. Emmanuel's finding is really concerning. He doesn't say it in this snippet, but he found this disparity not just in Philadelphia, but all over the country. 
Based on what we've discussed regarding redlining, it wouldn't be surprising to hear black applicants would be denied more in general because home ownership allows you to accumulate wealth, that wealth can get passed down to future generations, and as a result, the wealth of black people today would be affected by those nearly century-old policies. It would be troubling, of course, and certainly is a real issue in its own right. Wealth inequality is even larger than income inequality between black and white Americans today, in part for this reason. But what Emmanuel is saying is that even if you adjust for the applicant's financial situation, black Americans are still getting denied at higher rates, and he found the same for Latino applicants as well. They're getting denied at higher rates, even though it has been illegal for 53 years to do that. To precisely pinpoint what's causing this disparity is a little beyond my expertise, but if Emmanuel did adjust for financial situations, adjust for loan size, adjust for all these variables except race, and there's still a gaping disparity in the data, then clearly race is a factor. I can't see a way it wouldn't be. So why do I say all this? Well, mainly to depress you on this lovely Friday morning or whenever you're listening, but also because this history really sets up why gentrification is more of a problem than just a sudden invasion of plastic urban outfitters' vines. Normally, the rise of property values and rents in an area is a simple case of the free market doing its magic, but instead of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, it's giving the rabbit a mortgage. In fact, many define economics to be the study of how society allocates scarce resources. In this case, scarce resources being apartments above a Whole Foods. If out-of-towners are willing to pay more in rent or buy the property for a high price, economic wisdom would encourage it. But this is different. It's not working as a free market now, because when we look to history, it wasn't a free market before. It's easy to look at this and want to either throw economics out the window or throw history out the window, but unless we're talking about a STEM major's gen ed requirements, I don't think either of those are a good idea. History and economics both have a role in this conversation. Knowing this history that prevented people of color from buying suburban homes and kept them in suburban neighborhoods, thereby preventing them from accumulating wealth and then not investing in those neighborhoods, it becomes even more frustrating to see how gentrification affects residents. Economically, residents basically have two choices when the neighborhood receives an investment and the rent skyrockets, move out or pay up. If they move out, they don't receive any benefit from the changed neighborhood, and certainly will face a lot of challenges associated with moving, be it finding a new and affordable home, long commutes, being far from their friends and family, and even a long list of mental, emotional, and physical health effects. If they stay, they're suddenly struggling to pay rent, but they're also surrounded by a neighborhood that's not just unfamiliar, but inaccessible. Just listen to Loretta McDonald, a longtime resident of Brooklyn, New York, share her frustrations after living through gentrification that led small businesses all throughout her neighborhood to have to close down. What about the restaurants where you could send your child, you could take your child, you can feel like well, I can afford this? But that's gone too. Now everyone went there very reasonable and food was very good and this is one of the affordable places. Most of the neighbors went there on Sundays. We need to think about all people, not just a certain group of people. Loretta's frustration about restaurants and other neighborhood staples closing down raises an important concern. Even if residents manage to swing the rent, they might not be able to afford the new additions to the neighborhood. Their neighborhood finally gets some outside investment, they find a way to stick around, and they're still excluded from enjoying it. It's not just restaurants, but grocery stores, laundromats, really any community staple that people have to pay for in addition to their rent. And studies show that financial strain coupled with losing pieces of your community lead to adverse health effects as well. To Loretta, these new additions to the community replacing more affordable establishments are not improving the neighborhood, but are actually not thinking of the needs of current residents. All right, so how does gentrification connect to the environment? We're going to cover two ways today, starting with urban green space. 
The Sweaty Penguin just did an episode on urban green space, so I recommend you check that out. Whoever that guy who hosted it was did a really good job. Essentially, the episode explored how parks and trees and gardens can, if executed properly, bring a lot of benefits to a community, environmental, economic, and health benefits. It also discussed that decades of research has continued to observe that in city after city, green spaces are disproportionately located further away from low-income households, households with children, and most prominently, Black, Latino, and Asian households. In fact, the Hispanic Access Foundation reported that these communities of color are nearly three times more likely to live in a nature-deprived area than white communities. It would make sense, then, to focus investment in green space on these communities, right? Well, I think you can already see where this is going. Here's Dr. Isabel Anguilovsky of the Barcelona Laboratory for Urban Environmental Justice and Sustainability presenting research on that exact question from her and her colleague, James Connolly. One early studies, for example, that we published that my colleague uh, James Connolly published in 2018 was looking at New York City. And so what James showed is that the areas that um, had the highest composite greening score between 1990 and 2014, which are the census tracts that you see in dark gray here, were also those that gentrified the most between 1990 and 2014. So the spatial juxtaposition or even overlap between greening and uh, gentrification. The areas that got the most green space were also the areas that saw the most gentrification. Dr. Anguilovsky and Dr. Connolly found this same result in Washington, D.C. and Barcelona as well. Hearing her say that, one question popped into my head. Did the green space cause the gentrification, or did the gentrification cause the green space? In other words, was it green space making rents and properties more expensive, or was it wealthier and whiter residents deciding to build parks and gardens? Like the classic chicken and egg scenario, there's probably an argument both ways. Except in this case, instead of chickens crossing the road, it's boutiques and artisan coffee shops. Dr. Anguilovsky does sort of suggest the latter later in the presentation, but the more I think about it, the more I wonder how much it even matters. Obviously, it matters to some degree, but if green space leads to gentrification, we have a problem. Long-time residents can't enjoy the environmental, economic, and health benefits of this investment in their community. And if gentrification leads to green space, we have a similar problem. Investment in the community didn't happen until it got whiter and wealthier, meaning long-time residents once again can't enjoy the environmental, economic, and health benefits of this investment in their community. They were just driven out beforehand. Since green space very often is a public investment, no matter which way you cut it, it's concerning. Either the city is trying to help a disenfranchised community and instead gentrifying it, or they're refusing to invest in a community until it becomes gentrified. Whichever way that data is interpreted, we have cause for concern. Now, this green space issue poses an indirect climate concern, since oftentimes, green space can have a cooling effect in a neighborhood, among other climate benefits. That said, there's also a much more direct climate concern. We've discussed in episodes such as megacities how our cities are predominantly on coasts. Because of that, these cities face the threat of sea level rise and oftentimes floods and tropical storms. So let's take a look at how that plays out. One scenario is a case of low-income households living right on the coast. Floods hit, hurricanes hit, and the cost to repair the house over and over or pay for flood insurance keep going up, essentially creating the same problem. Low-income households have to choose to move out or pay up. Only this time, it's not higher-income residents moving in, it's the ocean moving in. And yes, the ocean also happens to be a successful proctologist. I mean, how else did it afford a beachfront property in this economy? Again, this feels a little different from gentrification, and doesn't quite square with the definition I gave earlier, but it really is the same exact dilemma when you actually lay it all out. Another scenario is where a low-income household lives right on the coast, and the city invests in climate resilience, be it seawalls, or jetties, or Robert De Niro standing on the beach giving the ocean a death glare. Now that the home has received some protection from climate change, the property value, or rent, 
might go up. We'll get to if they're a homeowner in a second, but if they're a renter, they could see their rents go up as a result of the improvement. That, again, leads to gentrification. The third scenario is a bit different. Say we have a high-income household living on the coast. No seawalls or De Niro. They're seeing floods and hurricanes, or they're listening to the sweaty penguin. They might decide to leave their property and move to higher ground. When enough people decide that, if a neighborhood in a city is at a relatively high elevation, property values could skyrocket and gentrification could take hold. In Miami, that's already happening in the neighborhood of Little Haiti, which is seven feet above sea level. Here's Michael Bieneme, a homeowner in Little Haiti, on one of many letters from realtors offering to buy his property. That's one, but this one, that's the one that scare me. Dear Mr. Bieneme, as a time for you to move, they scared me because they told me that's the time for me to leave the property. This is my property. I don't say I have for sale. So this is disrespect. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. No, no, no. It's time for you to leave the property. That doesn't sound like an offer. It sounds like a threat. Given the challenges people of color have faced in becoming homeowners, to pester the ones that are into coughing up their homes is probably not the direction we should be going in. Obviously, if they want to sell, that's one thing, but to send letters upon letters and use intimidation tactics is truly inexcusable. That's why I'd still be concerned for a low-income homeowner on a coast that's received resilience investment, and why I'm certainly concerned for anyone in one of these high-elevation communities. If a realtor would send that letter, who knows how far people would go to acquire these properties. If you've ever been to a timeshare seminar, you know when it comes to houses, an offer you can't refuse can quite literally be an offer you can't refuse. Now, some weeks are easier for me to give you solutions than others, but this week, I can tell you I have yet to find one I like. We actually dug up some in our research, but none really made an effort to square away the historical injustices with simple economic principles. On the one hand, we've seen how the Fair Housing Act failed to rectify this issue in 53 years because it just created a free market without addressing the historical injustices. On the other hand, something like rent control, for example, has been shown to create housing shortages, discourage developers from building, and discourage landlords from making improvements to the property, since it flies in the face of basic economics. Any of these ideas, even controversial ones, can absolutely be starting off points. But they can't all be winners. They're not Ted Lasso or the Crown. So I guess my solution, as little as it may sound, would be to take gentrification seriously and keep an open mind. Remember, the issue stems from an injustice straight from the federal government that heavily contributed to wealth inequality between white people and people of color. If you follow politics, you may have heard ideas for how to address that wealth inequality before. You might have an idea you like, and you might not. You might have 20 bumper stickers saying the birds work for the bourgeoisie, or you may own a blue sedan with a single sticker that reads, Dogs are cool. And even if you do like a policy idea that's out there, I'm guessing you haven't figured out how it would work in practice. That's why having an open mind and encouraging the government or academic researchers to study different wealth inequality policy avenues and how they could work in practice may be a step forward. It sounds a little scary to think that research could come back with a policy idea that you don't like, but that's what that policy development process is for. This is a really tough problem to solve, and the solution may be improving on an existing idea, or it may be something we haven't thought of yet. Either way, it'll take thinking outside the box, so acknowledging gentrification exists, is complicated and uncomfortable, and demands an open mind, is crucial in finding solutions. And with that, I'm off to find a lemonade stand, preferably one whose lemonade wasn't $14 at Whole Foods. Do you wish people based their definition of the word planet on a cartoon dog they liked as a kid? 
If so, Pluto is for you. Pluto might not be experiencing global warming or have people marching in the streets with signs saying save the planet, but hey, at least we are a planet. Stop crossing Neptune's orbit, you idiot. Pluto, cause size does matter. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Malo Hudson, the Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia. Dr. Hudson, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. First off, I want to start with your most recent book, The Urban Struggle for Economic, Environmental, and Social Justice, Deepening Their Roots. Could you tell us a bit about the book? Yes, uh, my book, The Urban Struggle for Economic, Environmental, and Social Justice, Steeping Their Roots, is really about how are people surviving given the high cost of housing, the high cost of living in various cities. The cities that I look at are really four case studies, San Francisco, Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. And oftentimes when we're talking about neighborhood change or gentrification, depending on people's perspective, there were all, always blaming someone for these, these issues and what happens to people. And in fact, it's a complicated situation. And instead of sort of getting into who the gentrifiers are, I wanted to understand how are people just surviving? Long-term residents in various communities, oftentimes these are communities of color, how are they surviving? That title is kind of perfect as it pertains to our podcast, because we look at every issue through an environmental lens, an economic lens, and a social lens. So when we talk about issues of gentrification, issues of displacement, how do these three lenses align? So when we think about gentrification and displacement, we can't talk about those things without thinking about the intersectionality between the economy, the social life that we all live, and certainly, um, you know, thinking about the environment and, and, and environmental justice. So let me give you an example. If we think about just the issues that we face, whether it be you know, the, the climate crisis and needing to, to build more climate resilient communities and cities, cities play a major role in this, right? We can think about it for a whole host of reasons. We can have efficient transportation systems. We can have more dense development that's got mixed uses. So you can walk more, you can bike, you can have uh, parks and open space integrated into that. And so it really can help reduce our carbon footprint for the average person. As we think about people moving towards cities, so the world is becoming more urbanized, certainly if we were to put this in the context of the United States, many cities have been growing. And so when you think about neighborhood change and gentrification, people are moving back into the cities. There's this movement that's, you know, it's been happening for some time, but certainly in the 1980s and certainly now where people like to be in the city and uh, they want to be able to wake up, go to the cafe, walk their children to school, go meet with friends at a bar, a restaurant, go for a jog. I mean, you know, the, the, the typical urban life that we see today. But at the same time, if you can't afford that, if you can't afford to live in a San Francisco or in a Manhattan or a Brooklyn or in a Boston, then you're moving further away. And therefore you then suddenly are find yourself commuting in adding to more traffic congestion because maybe the infrastructure is not in place. It's not to say we couldn't get more um, robust public transportation systems in place or really focus on encouraging people to you know, commute in a different way. I and mean, there are a lot of things we can do, but the reality is certainly looking at a place like San Francisco is commute times are uh, increasing because people are moving further and further away into the Central Valley. Uh, so, you know, hour and a half, two hours away. So that means they're getting in their car, they're driving in. Let's think about the mental health components of that, the stress of driving in, the stress of leaving your family, the stress of coming home late and not spending time with your kids, being able to help them with their work, their homework. You're just being so exhausted. By the time you get home, you basically eat and go to bed and do the same thing again. So there are ways to think about this from a holistic perspective of thinking how much farmland is being eaten up by this type of growth, how much is it impacting people's health, how is it impacting our social relationships, how is it impacting the economy in terms of worker productivity, in terms of people's happiness, in terms of all these things. Now, we've seen what's happened with the pandemic is that now there might be alternative ways for people to work. 
So we'll see what happens. But cities, in my opinion, are not going anywhere. They're only going to continue to grow. New York is rebounding. Uh, you'll find that around the world because there's a lot of functions to cities besides us just being social beings, but the economy is in, in with, with the way things are going, uh, in many ways favor us to be in these dense situations. Gentrification can be a really complicated and at times uncomfortable issue to think about sometimes, because of course many of us who have lived in a city have either seen it happen or seen its effects, but at the same time, we do want to see our cities improve, and when they do, it's going to inevitably lead to more outsiders wanting to live there. So how do you respond to someone that says gentrification is just an inevitable reality? Can you improve a neighborhood without these consequences for existing residents? When we talk about neighborhood change and gentrification, oftentimes people say, look, neighborhoods change. That's part of the economy. You're going to see this ebb and flow over time. And, and certainly from an, an economist's perspective. And the argument is that, look, this is just a natural evolution. And what can we really do about it? We want to improve neighborhoods. We want to improve areas that might have lacked investment. And so it's naturally going to improve and then that's going to make uh, increased demand and so forth. Uh, in many ways, yes, I understand that argument, but we can, as we think about our cities and as we think about our communities and our neighborhoods, we also have to think about our values. Oftentimes you'll see cities will make investments in the infrastructure of a neighborhood, right? And suddenly you see these cities saying we're improving uh, sidewalks, we're improving the streetlights, we're adding bike lanes, we're adding dog parks. And residents always laugh and the long-term residents always laugh and oftentimes communities of color and say, we know we're out of here once you see that because there's, there's investment in the infrastructure, but not investment in the people. And I think we could do both. We, we are sophisticated enough to do both, to say, yes, let's build, let's improve the infrastructure, but let's also invest in the people who have been, in, been there for some time. So what are we doing in terms of educational opportunities for the local residents, whether it be through the schools, whether it be through you know, job training, whether it be through just building housing that provides a certain amount of affordable housing or a scale of affordability given the local demographics that exist. For example, if we're talking about the economy, you can't talk about, and certainly the environment, you can't talk about food systems. One of the things you see when many of these neighborhoods change are these wonderful restaurants, the farm to table, you know, uh, the, the characterization that we always see, the, the cafe that's got the free trade organic coffee with the, you know, the, the wooden tables from the reclaimed wood somewhere. I mean, who doesn't like that, right? People like it, but they can't, most people can't afford that. And so it's not that residents don't want to see investment in their neighborhood. They want to be a part of that investment. They want to have some say so in what comes in and say, is there a way to have a mix that we can support the mom and pop? Maybe there's a loan program that lets the mom and pop that's been there forever, that knows the community, that's been hiring from the local community, could then get that investment to improve their cafe or to improve their local bodega or what have you. The environmental piece of this is really interesting, too, because we've talked about how climate change and pollution disproportionately affect low-income and minority communities in a city. We've talked about inaccessibility with green amenities. So to hear that cleaning up a brownfield or putting a green space or otherwise improving the environment in one of these communities could drive up property values and lead to gentrification honestly can make you feel a bit hopeless. So what does it take to improve the environment in these communities in a way that's truly just and equitable? When we think about our communities, and certainly those that have been underserved or under-resourced or just haven't seen the kind of investment that, that's been needed, um, if, if you know, and we have a strategy of sort of thinking about, well, how do we improve the overall environment to make it healthy for people and accessible? We have to have really take an integrated strategy, right? It is thinking about meeting with people and finding out what their needs are. Uh, oftentimes, if we're looking at it from a cultural competency perspective, thinking about the different cultures in a city, how do we make spaces for intergenerational connectivity, right? Where do we actually interact with each other? We know more and more people are going online through social media. We have our own views, but in terms of a city and thinking about our environment, thinking about ways to actually interact, places to relax, people, places to recreate, they have to take into consideration the type of people that are there, the cultures that are there. And I would say it has to be an integrated strategy. One that says we have, we have, yes, we have bike lanes, we have dog parks, but we also have places to play basketball. We have places to play, you know, soccer or football, depending on what part of the world you're from in other things, right. Or just to relax and, and to do yoga and Tai Chi, whatever it is, 
we have to do that. And we can't just, you know, say we're going to put this here or under invest there and that's it. We've given it to you. Getting to even just a simpler thing, trees. Trees are so incredibly important for thinking about these increased heat that we see in the cities, right? These heat islands that Eric Kleinenberg uh, at NYU has talked about in his book, Heat Wave, looking at uh, Chicago. Uh, we need more trees and the data is coming out and it's overwhelming to show that areas that have been segregated, uh, you know, redlined through ra racial residential segregation, oftentimes lack the same amount of investment in the environment. So the number of trees and shaded areas and grasses makes a huge difference, right? And compared to more affluent areas that tend to have all of those things. And so that alone, if you run into a situation where we had the global pandemic and people are in their homes and largely isolated, or we run into a situation where you have 110 degree plus weather in the north Northwest and up into parts of Vancouver and other parts of Canada, where are people going to cool down if they're not cooling centers, if they don't have air conditioning, if they don't have people who are looking out for them. I think we have to think that way. We have to re-envision our cities. We have to re-envision our cities in the context of what we're dealing with when it comes to climate, when it comes to our environment, and when it comes to really building these healthier, sustainable communities, cities, and neighborhoods. As climate change worsens, gentrification seems to be worsening too. In coastal cities, for example, you might have high-income coastal property owners trying to move into low-income neighborhoods at higher elevations, or you might have low-income families on the coast get pushed out by the ocean or what have you. How big of a role do you see climate change playing in the larger issue of gentrification moving forward? As we look at the change in our climate, um, certainly thinking about sea level rise, thinking about the intensity of storms, so whether that be, uh, you know, stronger hurricanes or just situations where there are the change in rain patterns, where we go long periods without any rain and then have these downpours that flood the coastline, that flood our rivers or lead to the fires that you might see in California or in Australia. And certainly what we've seen in Greece, where people literally go and jump in the water to get out of the, get away from. As sea level rises, we have to worry about our coastal cities, certainly in the United States, going everywhere, all the way from, you know, Boston around to the Gulf of Mexico. Some, you know, this is the back of the envelope, guess some 130 million people. That's significant. What happens to a place like Miami if it finds itself slowly becoming uh, inundated with water? A New Orleans, which we've seen, you know, what's, what's coming after Hurricane Katrina and certainly seeing the slow erosion of, of land and that's just being swallowed up by water. Where are people going to go? And how does that impact our economy? How does that impact our food systems? How does that impact just people's everyday lives, right? In terms of they've been there for decades and generations after generations, and suddenly now they have to think about moving because their freshwater sources are now being contaminated. They used to deal with a flood every, you know, five years or so, and now it's become every year and it's more, more than just once a year. This is a significant issue. It's not only a significant issue from the everyday health perspective of people need to move and the stress around that, the economy, our food systems, but the instability of our, frankly, our economic system. If the models are correct, what, there won't be long before Miami's just not, you know, really livable for most people. So then what other place might, is it the Cleveland? You know, I always joke with my colleagues and say, Cleveland uh, seems like a pretty good place to be right now, to invest now and move there now, because it's, you know, places that have fresh water access, that the climate may, this, you know, winters may not be as strong as they used to be. There might be opportunities to have more fertile land where the growing season may be longer. Um, I think we have to, I think we're going to have to really start thinking about that in a serious way. You've also done work on the health effects of gentrification, and I think it may surprise some people that gentrification causes health effects. It certainly surprised me. But it's weird because green space also causes positive health effects. You might have improved air quality, easier access to produce, places to exercise or socialize. If you consider that the stress of moving or paying higher rent creates negative effects and add in the positive effects of green space, how do we put that together? Could we say it's a net negative or net positive, or is there any way to make sense of the complexity? I mean, there's a lot of complexity there, right? So as you know, whether you eat well and whether you smoke, drink, that's all important too. But what we do know is that neighborhoods that have high levels of violence 
neighborhoods that have lower performing schools, neighborhoods that are not walkable, that are not safe, that don't have spaces for uh, recreation or shaded areas just to sit under a tree or to sit in a park or ex access to healthy food. We know those neighborhoods, the people in those neighborhoods tend to have poor health, right? So in that respect, we don't have to wait for all of the social epidemiology literature or you know, the new methods that are gonna come out. We have people working on that now and they're doing a wonderful job. But at the end of the day, there's things we can do now. We can act now to say, how do we integrate the environment into the communities? How do we build healthier housing? What would happen if we approached our, our social housing, our public housing and said, let's renovate it. Let's put in healthier materials. Let's make sure that we have gray water. Let's make sure that we put solar panels. Let's make sure that it's also integrated into the broader uh, health services that might be in a community. Imagine that and the kind of savings on emergency room visits, the kind of things we can do around improving economic opportunity, educational opportunity for young people. We have to be creative. We have to think outside the box. And these ideas are out there. It's, and I would argue it's the matter of what would that look like? What would that look like and what kind of changes would it make for our healthcare system costs? for overall people's life expectancy, and just the overall quality of a city. With gentrification, there's sort of two clashing ideas. The economic principles that say we want freedom to live where we want, we want new businesses, we want to allocate resources as efficiently as possible. And the historical piece that says we had redlining, we had other unjust policies that prevented people of color from accumulating wealth. And since the effects of these policies are still playing out to this day, we can't just ignore that and leave this up to the free market. How do policymakers square these two ideas away? How do they even begin to tackle gentrification when the issue is so challenging and complicated? As we think about building a healthier city, community, neighborhood, we have to take a holistic, comprehensive, and really engaged perspective. And let me, let me just talk about what I mean by that. One is, what is the overall plan for the region, right? I mean, pollution doesn't care about uh, zip codes or jurisdictions. If air pollution is going to go everywhere, but certain areas are more exposed than others, right? Their health risks are much higher. So we need a comprehensive approach to what is our vision for a region? How are we engaging residents at the local level all the way up to the top, right? It's what do people want to see? And then we need a strategy that's integrated that says these communities here really need X, Y, and Z. This community over here already has that, but they need a pool for a community pool for, for the children. Or, you know, they really need a community center for uh elderly residents that are in the community that really have no place to go and they can get to know each other and not be isolated. I mean, and it's not, you know, a top-down approach. It's an integrated approach and it's, and it's piece by piece because what is good for one community may not be good for the other. But what we can do is ensure that there's an equitable process. There's a way to try to be more open in our process. So if we think about the kind of technological tools we have today, there are many ways to get people's opinions. There are many way, many modes to engage, whether it be knocking on doors, whether it be through social, social media, whether it be in these public events that we have, whether it be concerts, things in the park. We can get people's opinion. Dean Hudson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This wraps up episode 59 of The Sweaty Penguin. Remember, you can get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict. That helps boost us in their algorithms. You can also get a shout out by joining our Patreon. And you'll get not just a shout out, but merch, bonus content, even a chance to win a signed book from one of our experts. Head to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin to unlock all that cool stuff and help grow the show. Once again, The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Olivia Amate, Ethan Brown, Shannon Demiano, and Maddie Schmidt, 
fact-checked by Megan Crimmins, and edited by Frank Hernandez. Our producers are Olivia Amite, Ethan Brown, Megan Crimmins, Shana Damiano, Frank Hernandez, Dane Kim, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Sabrina Rawlings, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. 